This is Carol from the Society of Thoracic Surgeons. This is the Adult Cardiac Surgery Database Quality Improvement Series webinar on decreasing vent time. Today, we will have presentation from Mark Pridmore, one of our um, database nurse database managers, and his physician, Dr. Joseph Arcidi, out of Providence St. Joseph Hospital in Eureka, California. I'm so excited to have them present with us, and I think this is going to be uh, one of the one of your top uh, presentations for this series that you'll want to refer back to. Um, a lot of uh, interesting things. Am I sharing my screen? Yeah. Uh, no, not yet. Okay. You are now. Thank you. So a lot of uh, interesting um, things coming out of this presentation. Please don't forget to use the Q&A function to go ahead and ask questions. And um, so I'm going to hand it over now to Dr. Arcidi. And he's going to walk through his presentation. I will stop sharing my screen so that Dr. Arcidi can go ahead and share his. And let me know, uh, Dr. Arcidi, go ahead and take it over whenever you're ready. All right. Do we have a, you see my screen then? Yes, I see it. Great. Well, good afternoon, everyone. And thank you for attending. Uh, Mark and I appreciate the opportunity to present our story along with Dr. Johnston. Since our experience is unique, I'm Joseph Arcidi, the sole cardiac surgeon at our center in Northern California. My co-host is, uh, along with Mark, is Dr. Jeffrey Johnston. And on the same line of the slide are his cardiac anesthesia colleagues. Uh, below them is Barry Steinbach uh, listed. He's our world-class perfusionist. Of course, I've mentioned Mark. Mark is our very compulsively accurate STS data manager and also help facilitate the webinar. Also listed are Dr. Regley, a fourth year undergrad student who helped us with this and um, other uh, projects as a summer research fellow. And of course, as you all know, without our OR team, we're really helpless. So this slide also shows our disclosures. Currently, just over 4% of cabbage patients are extubated in the OR. And depending on who's asked, the responses range from why bother to is it safe? Who benefits? And is there hard data for those benefits? After exploring the background, I'll introduce you to unique features of our program, and I'll discuss our implementation of OR extubation and our outcomes. Dr. Johnston will outline the nuts and bolts of anesthesia management, and then we look forward to questions and discussion. Operating room extubation can be seen as a progression. This is the National Quality Forum definition of prolonged ventilation, which we know at 24 hours represents a morbidity hard stop. This is the 1996 study that was responsible for establishing the six hour early extubation threshold. Six hours has become a standard in many health systems, including ours. And this paper from Dr. Badwar when he was in Pittsburgh gets the credit for moving things forward with extubation in the OR as a safe option. Before this, OR extubation was something that might've just been entertained in off pump cabbage patients. But we actually have to give credit where it's due. And in preparing this webinar, I came across this paper from the Lankenau Hospital Group just outside of Philadelphia. Because it was a manuscript uh, submission not presented at a meeting with no editorial, it really didn't generate any buzz. But it was actually first rate with large numbers of patients and propensity matching. Continuing down the slide on the right, they included balloon pump patients they had a very low reintubation rate, and they demonstrated a shorter length of hospital stay. But as the slide title implies, there really are a limited number of reports. This is that first Badwar report published in 2014. About three quarters of the patients were elective. It demonstrated a decreased length of stay. And importantly, it demonstrated a substantial decrease in hospital costs. This is the follow-up from the same group published three years later. 
the numbers were larger, and this study included STS risk. They retrospectively identified predictors of successful OR extubation, loosely define their low risk patients. As you can see, younger age, elective status, isolated cabbage, no chronic lung disease, no diabetes. This uh, report is really the only multicenter study. And this from the Virginia Quality Surgery, excuse me, Virginia Cardiac Surgery Quality Initiative. This is a 2000 article in press in seminars in thoracic and cardiovascular surgery. As you see in the top bar on the right, the blue bar, they compared in OR extubation to extubation less than six hours. The numbers were large and propensity matched, that statistical method. There were length of stay and cost benefits that they demonstrated, but there was both a higher reintubation rate and a bleeding rate with OR extubation. Yes, that picture is a laryngoscope. This important series was just presented this summer at the STS coronary conference. So it focused on isolated cabbage patients. It's from NYU and the numbers are large. The authors compared in OR extubation to extubation anytime post-op. The STS risk is low, but the highlight, and I have highlighted it, is that the length of stay within OR extubation was amazingly short. Less than half of those extubate with compared to less, with less than half of the, the uh, length of stay compared to those extubated later postoperatively. Really just amazing. So far we have the abstract and once it's published, the, man, the manuscript will certainly have an accompanying editorial. And it's in discussions and editorials that we as surgeons and others look to find important reactions and responses to OR extubation studies. This quote from Dr. Whitman of Johns Hopkins, of course, uh, one of our leaders in the field, uh, was in response to the first Dr. Badwar report, and it's an important one. And I'll just read, if in fact, patient satisfaction significantly benefits by intraoperative extubation, it might be worth it just for that. And we'll, we'll keep that in mind. This invited editorial by an anesthesiologist was to the follow-up Badwar study in 2017. And the uh, editorial documented very nicely the evolution in anesthesia management over the decades in cardiac surgery and there was another critical statement, and I've got that highlighted. One can easily make the argument that all patients, irrespective of the procedure or patient characteristics, should be treated right from the start as if they can be extubated in the operating room. But actually not everyone is on board with OR extubation. And I've got this editorial to kind of review with you all. The funny thing, this editorial actually didn't refer to an article on OR extubation. Nevertheless, the two anesthesiologists felt the need to, cre to critique the, OR, the idea of OR extubation very thoroughly. And first they questioned the motivation and they talked about three motivators. I've got this highlighted. A shorter ICU length of stay, reduced, uh, financial, reduced financial costs, and then they also added this, maybe a motivator was perhaps that allowed the physicians to feel, put in quotation marks, like they're doing a good job. Next, they question the safety and logistics. The distance from the OR to the ICU is one thing, that first highlight, but they worried about delirium and they also worried about interference with their handoff. Going further, they even question the validity of any hospital cost savings. They said there were no changes to patient charges or hospital reimbursement. And they said, well, we're not about to reduce the workforce of respiratory therapists or the number of ventilators, so there's no cost savings there. They said, well, there's maybe a length of stay improvement, but that may not be meaningful. 
And then they finally brought out their, their thought that, well, this is only if patients actually move through the hospital at a faster rate. And this was their conclusion, and I've highlighted it, that there was no evidence to move toward OR extubation. However, at no place in the editorial did the author cite any personal experience with OR extubation after heart surgery. So where are we with uh, OR extubation in what one might call the strength of recommendation pathway? That is, what is the level of evidence or LOE grade for OR extubation? And I would say at this point, we don't have a level of evidence rating. We're simply just gathering evidence. So far, is it safe? Currently, only Virginia shows an increased reintubation rate. Does it decrease length of stay? Well, to very real amounts, yes. And I think all of us know that there are multiple factors, however, that will enter into length of stay, such as frailty. Well, what about patient satisfaction? And clearly it is a big plus, but it hasn't been formally evaluated. And I wanted to highlight the highlight from Dr. Whitman again. If in fact patient satisfaction significantly benefits by intraoperative extubation, it might be worth it just for that. But I want to go back to that unfavorable, unfavorable editorial one more time. One thing struck me about the apparent logistic barriers. Let's look at these two, the one about emergence delirium and the interference with the handout. And I'd point out, aren't they reminiscent to these? That is some of the same logistical bar barriers that we overcame to achieve the six hour early extubation threshold. I use this article uh, from the journal of critical care nurse in my ICU nursing education series at our hospital. And my wife gets it since she's um, uh, a uh, pediatric open heart ICU nurse. This article described the logistic barriers for six hour extubation at Duke. From my perspective, if you look at these items here that I've outlined, there's a common thread between these and the previous slide with the issues in the that we saw in the editorial. And frankly, I think that most of us have already been there or been there and done that already, that we've kind of overcome uh, these logistic hurdles. Now, spoiler alert, our, our experience with OR extubation uh, handoff has been smoother than what the editorial suggests. We no longer see this. That is cycles of agitation and sedation with um, uh, hyper and hypo uh, tension. But it's very hard to quantify this effect of smoothing out this sine wave curve. All right, now this is us. Eureka, California is 230 miles or four and a half hour drive from the Bay Area. You see the redwoods and the coastline. The, uh, the geography is ruggedly beautiful. Unfortunately, the gas prices two years ago were ruggedly expensive. This is our team and this is our hospital. What else is unique? We're in the northernmost quarter of the state that is underserved and has some of the worst health outcomes. This is the STS operative mortality risk of our cardiac surgery patients year by year for isolated cabbage and for all cases. Especially this year, our mortality risk not only exceeds the STS, but we also have more than twice the risk of the rest of our Providence Health System in California. This is our year by year operative mortality for all STS procedures going from 2021 through the current year. This is where we rank in the entire Providence Health System for cabbage. And you can see that arrow over to the far lower right. This is where we rank in the entire Providence Health System for all case O to E morbidity. And of course, I've whited out the other program names. 
This is one of the unique features of our program. We have been big adopters of multi arterial grafting for coronary bypass grafting. This includes radial artery grafts and bilateral IMA grafting. You can see we're really um, more than a couple multiples uh, more than the rest of the STS. And this letter to the editor from us should appear in the December Annals of Thoracic Surgery. Nearly 47.6% of our patients, nearly half of our patients receive multiple arterial grafts. And the numbers are small, but as we've seen in the previous slide, the patient risk certainly isn't. And of course, another unique feature of our program is our extubation. The left half of the next few slides is a scrolling description and the right side cites literature. When, why, and how. We started things in January, 2021. Why? There was new surgical leadership that is your humble narrator. And uh, how? Well, our first patient was an isolated two vessel coronary bypass operation. Patient had good LV function and and we extubated him in the operating uh, on the operating table in the room. We would highlight that collaboration with our three cardiac anesthesiologists is important and very, very truly, seriously, we're recruiting for another cardiac anesthesiologist. So seriously, if there's anyone offline, please uh, get, get to us through Carol or, or whomever. So uh, I'd also mention we, of course, have a world-class perfusionist. And again, highlighting on the right here, Dr. Whitman has pointed out how important it is that for this effort to work, it's got to be a team, surgeons, anesthesiologists, perfusionists. Scrolling down in the left panel, the perfusionist craze plays a critical role, so much so it's worth citing Dr. Whitman again. We use short pump circuits, retrograde autologous priming on everyone, and we really aggressively hemoconcentrate, and this is especially important in our valve patients, many of which who, whom will come to the operating room uh, with pronounced heart failure. Rewarming is important. Dr. Whitman's editorial was for this most recent contribution for Dr. Badwire's program in West Virginia. The reference is there up in the upper right here, and I'd urge anyone interested in the topic to review it. This slide crystallizes their, sum, their strategy. Minimal long-acting opioids, avoiding bleeding, and of course, the team approach. Continuing the scrolling panel, oh, Dr. Johnson just, uh, was planning to speak. He's just gotten word to me that he's gonna be tied up, but he's given me his slides, uh, so I will be able to present them for him. Anyway, uh, finally, as far as coordination with ICU nursing and, and respiratory therapy, communication is everything. And I've included uh, in uh, the uh, comment from Dr. Badwar's group, and this is interesting. Once OR extubation has been established as a routine, the intubated patient arriving to the ICU will become a rarity. And more so, Patients, their families, and the referring providers will come to expect it. And frankly, that's been our experience also. So almost immediately after our first cases, we rapidly expanded OR extubation beyond isolated cabbage. And our approach quickly became that all cardiac surgical patients are treated as candidates for OR extubation in line with the editorial on the right that we saw earlier. We evaluated our experience for this year's Eastern Cardiothoracic Meeting. We reviewed all 66 patients with STS predicted mortality risk scores operated on between January 2021 and March 2023. We did not exclude emergent patients or those with a preoperative balloon pump. We compared two groups of patients, isolated cabbage, and those having a valve procedure alone or with cabbage. We also looked to identify any predictors of successful operative room extubation 
beginning with univariate analyses. These are our overall results. Fully 88% of our patients were extubated in the OR. There were no reintubations. There was a 0% operative mortality. And there was an all case 0.56 O to E STS morbidity. This table compares isolated cabbage and patients having a valve procedure. First, I want to direct your attention to the red square, that is the STS morbidity, mortality risk and prolonged ventilation risk. They were certainly higher compared to the only other published report of OR extubation from 2017. You can see there is quite a difference. Isolated, isolated cabbage patients in this row had a particularly high surgical uh, urgency compared to valve patients. And there was a trend toward more males and lower ejection fraction uh, uh, in the cabbage patients. But OR extubation on the bottom row was equivalent between cabbage and valve patients. When we identified univariate predictors of successful extubation in the operating room, the results were paradoxical. That is, extubation in the OR was associated with higher age, lower ejection fraction, and higher STS predicted risk of mortality, clearly the opposite of one would when that what one would expect intuitively. Our explanation for this is that extubation in the OR at our center was primarily based on the ability to oxygenate and ventilate irrespective of the patient's age, their ejection fraction, or their STS predicted mortality risk. And frankly, because of these findings with the univariate predictors, we didn't pr proceed with multivariate predictors. So in conclusion, our operating room extubation experience is the first reported from a community, a remote community program. It demonstrated that OR extubation can be successfully and safely undertaken in centers with smaller case volumes. We had higher proportions of challenging risk patients than in any other reported OR extubation series. Secondly, OR anesthesia management for isolated coronary bypass grafting was readily transferable to the valve and valve cabbage patient groups. And success with OR extubation accompanied program achievements in mortality and morbidity. So I can pull up Dr. Johnston's slides here. So, uh, Dr. Johnston, one of our three cardiac anesthesiologists, has, has given us some slides which I think are just fantastic. And these, these kind of this kind of detail really isn't out there in the uh, in any of the published reports so far. What are some of the things that that he looks at, and we look at it as, as a team? Uh, we look at these patients to see if there's a sleep apnea history. Um, part of that assessment is a stop bang score, which I've placed here on the right. Snoring, tiredness, obstructive apnea, and, and you can see there. Um, patients who've had a sleep study, patients who should be on CPAP, but decided not to use it. One of the things that Dr. Johnson is particularly attuned to is CO, a COPD history, any history of other pulmonary disease like restrictive lung disease, or previous uh, thoracic surgery. It'd be great if they can be optimized by a pulmonologist. Sometimes that can be difficult. Patients that are on home oxygen or bronchodilators, do we have pulmonary function tests in these patients? Or even so far as a rumor ABG. And Mark and I um, are, and anyone who had, has had a smoking history, we certainly try to get uh, PFTs um, and uh, more often than not, a room air ABG. <clears throat> Obesity can be a red flag, but not something that omits the patient from consideration from OR extubation 
but something we have to prepare for. Dr. Johnson is going to be anticipating a potential difficult airway. And many of these obese patients are going to have a decreased uh, residual lung capacity or residual capacity. And as a result, they're going to desaturate quickly. These patients are likely to require BiPAP after they're extubated in the operating room. Um, patients with end-stage renal disease, renal dialysis patients, they're always going to have more fluid on board. Did they get dialyzed recently? And strict fluid management's important there because there's no way of getting it off in the form of urine. And that's where someone like um, uh, Barry Steinbach, our perfusionist, is going to be really, uh, his contribution with hemoconcentration concentration is going to be critical. What are the other things? Um, how to manage op opioids. And this is, this is a, a great quote from, from Dr. Johnston. It is controversial that the three anesthesiologists have four different opinions. So uh, his approach is a fairly conservative one. And I think they would all certainly lean that way a maximal fentanyl uh, dose of five to 600 mics during the case, using small doses of any long acting opioids uh, during the closure phase. And we perform a fairly um, a rigid um, uh, sternal closure that might take a little extra time, but we find it's worth it. You can see the small doses of dilaudid and morphine but there are also some important adjuncts that are non-opioid. Everyone gets IV Tylenol. We certainly aren't using any Toradol. A Presidex drip is important. And on the field, I'm uh, putting in everyone uh, some parasternal blocks uh, with rapivacaine. And in those patients who have had an, I, uh, an internal mammary artery uh, taken, they get intercostal blocks from the inside by me with rapivacaine as well. We do not have uh, access to Xperel uh, anywhere in the Providence system. As uh, we're getting closer to planned extubation in the operating room, Dr. Johnson will make sure that they have a complete neuromuscular blockade reversal that is with Sugamidex. He'll start a spontaneous breathing trial with pressure support once the chest is closed might titrate some additional opioids if they're getting tachypneic, making sure that patients have acceptable tidal volumes with low levels of pressure support, that they're not requiring you know, very high strength uh, pressors or catecholamines, that the patients are normothermic, that there's no uh, evidence of pulmonary congestion, uh, such as froth in the endotracheal tube in some of the valve patients, and he's careful to make sure that after uh, taking out the um, TEE probe, that gastric contents are suctioned with an orogastric tube. Uh, and after extubation, the patients are gonna be maintained on a, on a low dose Presidex strip, generally 0.5 mics per kilo per hour, which allows the patients to follow simple commands such as take deep breaths or put their, your arms down, but it avoids the agitation um, during transfers to the ICU uh, at that kind of dosing. As we talked about communication, it's important that the RT and BiPAP are on standby in the ICU in case we need them. We also um, are fond or will occasionally at least use nasal airways in patients who might be a little bit borderline. And uh, Dr. Johnson points out that RTs and nurses are typically afraid of oral airways with BiPAP, but nasal airways are fine. Um, we have now seen that our ICU nurses, just like those in the PACU, uh, are really, it's really important for them to be comfortable uh, with patients that are extubated deeply as some of the PACU nurses are. And so it's important for them just like uh, the RTs to be uh, comfortable with jaw thrust or mask ventilation skills in the occasional patient. But we haven't had any patient that needed to be reintubated. And I think that may be it. So Carol, I'm going to stop sharing, but then show um, hopefully 
myself on a video here. Yeah, that was a, a wonderful presentation, Dr. RCD. Thank you so much for presenting to us. I've written down some questions. I, we saw you. There you are. Oh, I'm, you're on. am I back again or not yep, yet? Yep, you're here. Yeah. Oh, good. Yeah, great. Thank you. That was a great presentation. Um, quite a few questions have come in. I have some questions for you. And I just want to say, um, coming from a small hospital background, I feel proud for you that you guys were able to achieve that. I, I can imagine what it feels in your heart to see that you're doing something so good um, with the resources that you have available and the population that you're treating. So congratulations on that. I have tears in my eyes because I always do because I think about the patients, but uh, congratulations. So Carol, that, gonna... that means a lot coming from you <laughs> um, because it, it really has been, you know, the whole program has really been a labor of love. And, um, you know, we're, we're growing um, slower than we thought. And again, we're looking for a cardiac anesthesiologist <laughs> to join us. So anyone, anyone can please reach out to us. Um, we thought this would be a great forum to, to make that. that yeah. bit. If Go ahead. Has Do any. you want to sure. field the questions, Carol? Yeah, I'll read them to you. And I might even add in a um, couple extra uh, words to these questions to answer my own questions in the selfish way that I, I am sometimes with the Q&A. Uh, but uh, here's the first question. Are patients who are extubated in the OR excluded from the calculated... Oh, this is for STS from Nicole. Are patients who are extubated in the OR excluded from the calculated variables denominators for isolated cab initial vent times less than six hours? We include those patients in the denominator uh, for the initial vent times less than six hours. Um, and the next question from Hannah, Hannah Whitney. You've already answered this, but I think... Um, they always like to hear it twice just so it sticks. Do you use, um, do you reverse the neuromuscular blockers? And could you talk a little bit more about that? Sure. Yeah. I think a, a lot of us, and, and um, you know, I, I appreciate that Dr. Um, Johnston really is a stickler about Sugamidex. And if you look at Dr. Badwar's uh, group's contributions, they mentioned Sugamidex. Uh, directly. And I think it's so reliable and complete the neuromuscular uh, reversal that one gets that I, I think Dr. Johnson uh, for certain has been um, um, very staunch uh, using Sugamidex as the uh, reversal agent of choice. Thank you. Next question, Adam. I'll add a little bit. This is from Sean. It says, what is your experience in the number of OR extubated patients that required re-intubation during the post-op period till discharge? And I'll add into that, do you, um, are most of your cases on or off pump? And do you see a difference in re-intubation between on and off pump cases? Well, I'll answer the second part first. We do a very modest amount of off-pump uh, bypass. Um, they would really be uh, the patients for whom um, uh, we we don't want to go on pump for for some of the reasons like like kidney disease or um, who we know may have a porcelain aorta. But really, off-pump is a very modest contribution. But um, we really look, if I remember the question, we really look to extubate everyone. And our parameters are, are really, again, we don't say, well, gee, this patient's X years old or their EF is this or whatever. Um, I think uh, like you saw in Dr. Badwar's sort of synthesis slide, Yes, we've got to make sure from our part surgically that, that the patient's hemodynamically reasonably stable. Yes, they'll still be on some catecholamine, but not large doses. And but we look to those parameters. Can they be, can they, are they ventilating well? Can they be, can they oxygenate well? And it's simply based on those that will make the decision to move forward provided the other things are fine. We, we're not going to, while it's nice to see these predictors, they're sort of retrospect. When you have expected, when you have the patient on the table, um, Dr. Johnston and his colleagues and us are just looking at really how the gas is. 
how's the patient doing in terms of their um, their uh, vent volumes at this point on on uh, pressure support? Great, thank you. And what is what uh, what's your experience with having to reintubate patients? Oh, thanks. Sorry, that was the yeah, first. That's part. okay. Oh, that was, yeah. you got it. I can think, we well, we haven't, and I hope that was clear in the presentation. Um, uh, from that uh, that series that we put together, and, and it ended right just before the abstract deadline for the Eastern, we hadn't had anyone who needed to be intubated. We have had one patient who, uh, well, he wasn't an OR extubation. Actually, yeah, right now, none of our OR extubation patients have ever had to be reintubated. Wow. That's wonderful. I mean, we have great ICU nursing uh, staff, and uh, it's, it's really a, um, I, I enjoy being academic and giving lectures um, uh, to the morning, to the day, day shift and the night shift every month. And what's nice to see is through the ranks, we had people who were just joining the ICU coming from our step down unit. And to see that six months or a year later now, they're taking care of heart patients. So it's been nice to see that, that progression. Yeah, that, that education gives us as ICU, my background's ICU. CVICU, it gives us the confidence we need to, to believe that we're doing the right thing. And when we do that, we're, we feel free to ask questions. Like, you know, we don't feel dumb and we know that we have support. So um, that education really means a lot um, from, for the ICU nurses. And yeah, and actually, as, as you would be the first one to admit, giving the presentations is important. You know, whether I, I come in at four in the morning or 10 in the evening to the, to the night shift, the best the best teaching is at the bedside. Mm -hmm. And that's right. so that's something that I don't shy away from. <laughs> Very good. Uh, what's your average length of times in the OR? And do you ever have trouble extubating in the OR when you're being pushed to turn the room over quickly for the next case? That's a great question. Now, with our volume right now, we're not really pushed in that direction. And frankly, our, our OR times um, and uh, bypass times are not particularly short. Um, they're certainly on the longer ends of things. And I, I think, um, yes, we have a wonderful perfusionist who, who will hemoconcentrate patients well. We have a, a good number of patients who are coming very fluid overloaded with CVPs in the upper teens, low 20s, when the swan is put in after they've gone to sleep. So, um, but it's important for us to make certain that we're doing the operation well. And uh, I would say that the only patients, I can think of a few patients who we deliberately decided not to extubate. And this is probably important to hear. When we have patients who are aortic dissection patients, um, we don't plan on extubating them in the room. They've had circ arrest, et cetera. We, we, we haven't gone there. Now that is, if we have patients who have an ascending aneurysm, that we're managing by, by clamping the aorta without hypothermic circulatory arrest, those patients have, have generally, I think almost all of them gotten extubated in the operating room. Um, I can think of a patient when it was actually with Dr. Johnston, he had a resting, a, resting, a, a room air PCO2 that was 57. So we really hesitated, can we actually get the patient successfully operated on. And Dr. Johnston and I uh, made the decision, this is not somewhere we're gonna extubate it in the room, but we'll probably have him going to the um, ICU on pressure support to see if, if the patient can be extubated in a relatively short period of time. So yes, we're pleased that 88% of all of our cases, that is cabbage and valve patients that have an STS risk score um, were extubated and continue to be extubated in the operating room. But yes, there'll certainly be a few outliers. Uh, what was surprising to us uh, is that after the very favorable experience with our first patient and the favorable reception uh, in the ICU, that it was very straightforward to kind of ramp up to doing 
um, some single valve patients, relatively straightforward valve, valve patients. So uh, we really found that the learning curve, or at least the experience curve, was one that was able uh, to, to be mounted fairly swiftly. Thanks. Yeah, thank you. That was a great answer. <laughs> uh, for Do you do a, a TF4, the measure TF4 at all on your patient? Oh, train of four? Yeah, the train of four. Well, I, I think by the time this has all uh, happened, I think Dr. Johnston and his colleagues, especially with the use of Sigamidex, are very confident uh, in the operating room that the patients are, are reversed. And these patients are, as I said, they're able to move their extremities. Um, many of them, well, most of them are able to respond to simple commands and things like that. We're not expecting them to be awake and reading and chatting with us as they're leaving the operating room. That's happened a few times, but um, um, so I think we don't, have the concerns about residual uh, paralysis, but certainly I think when one is in the ICU and has a patient who really doesn't seem to be either responsive, that's certainly going to be in the armamentarium, uh, and this is obviously an intubated patient at that point, um, uh, we certainly would think that getting a train of four is an important exercise to see why the patient isn't responsive. Sure, yeah. Okay, that's very good. Not that I'm judging, I don't know. I'm just saying thanks for the answer. That was a good answer. Um, and then another question from Hannah Whitney. Hannah's at our North Shore Hospital here in- um, Evanston. On the north side of Chicago. Yeah, Evanston. Yeah. And, they they also their group presented here to us a couple weeks ago another great presentation so she has a lot of questions because they're always you know north shore is also um on the path of always trying to decrease their vent times as well so yeah, we, um, their their presentation was wonderful but please yeah <laughs> thank you uh, the time from when you can uh, complete the surgery to extubation and moving out of the or What's that time frame look like? So surgery. It really, it really and... doesn't. It doesn't for us change sort of um, what Dr. Badwar would term the, the the dressing on wheels out time. Now understand that it's not common for us to um, be able to do two cases uh, in a day just because of our volume most of the time. Um, but really the this this is not like something that be, with our experience and frankly even from the get-go this is not something where okay patients reversed let's see how, if they wake up how they wake up it's now just all starting to happen during the closure phase so that that really it's it's just a smooth process when we're patients extubated tables in the room start to move over the lines, uh, then move over the patient. I mean, that's, it just happens like a regular case. It yeah. really hasn't delayed us. It's just part of your flow now. How long did it, it is. take for you all to get, for your team to get to that part where it's just a natural, uh, a natural flow in the OR? I'd say it's, it's the routine. And frankly, I think we were surprised um, you know, we were surprised from day one that it really wasn't a big, a big delay, that it really didn't pose a delay. It didn't, it, the, the learning curve was surprisingly fast and that should be encouraging. Um, and you know, I, I really did kind of harp on that editorial because it, it just um, sounded like folks who really hadn't gone the route or didn't have experience in or extubation um, making, you know, those, um, having those concerns and, and really being adamant about them. Um, we, we're the other nervous thing the that, that I really, I'm sorry, Carol. I'm sorry. I said, we're nervous about the things we don't know. So it's, it's yeah. not surprising, right? That we're nervous. And I really think that, um, a larger institution that has more resources than ours, I'm really looking forward to, uh, not only the patient satisfaction studies, uh, because that's clearly going to be, as Dr. Whitman uh, has pointed out, that's really going to be a driver for this. 
But also, it would be very nice. And there were some things like um, narcotic requirements, but it would be really great for someone with mathematical skill um, to be able to show that the sine wave of hypertension, hypotension with agitation and sedation gets barely, it gets really smoothed out because that's that's really the experience. What we find, of course, yesterday uh, afternoon, our, our patient coming out, um, I had kind of a, a late start. Um, that patient, um, yes, extubated in the operating room. This is someone who came in the OR with um, really uh, CVPs that were really surprisingly high. We didn't, we hadn't expected that, um, but got uh, had hemoconcentration of about four liters uh, during the case. We have a phenomenal perfusionist, again, world class. But yes, that patient's got extubated. And then the management is just typically, um, well, volume in order to help wean the catecholamines. So we just don't see this these big blood pressure swings. I would, if you don't mind, just relate one other story. I, I let one of our recent patients know that we were going to be presenting at this webinar. She's a local behavioral therapist, very intelligent woman. Um, she said, and she's a type one insulin diabetic who very scrupulously manages her blood sugars with an insulin pump, had substantial heart failure, uh, needed a mitral repair and coronaries and, you know, the, the typical very diffusely diseased diabetic vessels. She said, Dr. R.C., you tell them that the thing that I was so nervous about was still having an endotracheal tube waking up with that um, at the end, uh, you know, when I was in the ICU. She says, I was so relieved that when I woke up, I didn't have that. So, Yes, I think not every patient is going to have that same um, apprehension, but patient satisfaction is a big driver and will be one. That's, I, I can't imagine waking up with it, something breathing in my mouth and knowing that the team that's going to take care of me is so concerned about that too and getting it out before I wake up, not having somebody stand over me and say, okay, I'm going to pull this tube out of your mouth, you know, not having all of that and... Um, it's just, I imagine from the patient's perspective, um, it is a relieving thing. Hannah Whitney, of course, says patients hate waking up intubated. I think any CVICU nurse will tell you the same thing. Um, and we also hate taking care of that patient, uh, knowing that we're doing that to them, you know, and putting them, going through that with them. And then I am certain that your ICU staff probably, it was probably a game changer for them too. And you probably... Uh, by instituting this probably just ra raised the morale of just the whole ICU staff because now they're caring for patients that are awake and able to talk to them and uh, their pressures aren't all out of whack. Um, so it, it's uh, one or not as out of whack as they normally would be. So I think that that's uh, wonderful. Well, we, we'd like to think so. And of course, the, the critical partners in this, as, as you know, in a small, in a small town, um, mm -hmm. I mean, they become our ambassadors for the program. I mean, they tell their their church congregations, <laughs> their, their relatives, et cetera, et cetera, about the program. And, and just as Dr. Badwar pointed out, it now becomes an expectation. It's, well, why didn't they get extubated in the operating room? And really, that's that's how things have, have, have transformed. Yeah, now you have to answer for those questions at yes. SM, right? <laughs> So uh, next question uh, from Karen McNichol. Karen has two questions. The first one is about if you have any, uh, she realizes this is regarding extubation, but if you had any resources or strategies you would be able to share for the avoidance of bleeding in the OR, um, if you would be able to share those or uh, share them with me and I can pass them on to Karen McNichol, um, I'd be happy to do that. And then her. Sure. I'll do that. If you don't mind, I'll do that offline because I, I think our approach has changed on that a little bit, but I'd, be, I'd love to do that offline, but maybe we can just keep on topic on topic okay. here. Obviously, that is an important part of things. And uh, certainly there's some of those things like hypothermia, avoiding hypothermia. 
I mean, we have a really wonderful perfusionist. Barry Steinbach is world class. He's practiced. Um, he was with uh, um, David Adams at Mount Sinai in New York and Brigham in Boston. So we're just thrilled to have him as part of our team. It was one of the reasons that really induced me to to join our our the group here. That's wonderful. They have a Being the only surgeon. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know how you take vacation, but um, what's that? The For the patients who are not extubated in the OR, the reversal agents, do they, are they still receiving reversal agents? And if they are, where is that reversal agent given? Is it given in before they leave OR? Or are they given in the ICU? If they're given in the ICU, is it a give a protocol for your nursing staff? Great question. I think the ones like I, I talked about a couple of patient subsets, like like um, um, dissection patients, um, who we know we're not going to um, extubate. They're not likely re reversed in either place. Uh, we might be waiting until things wear off uh, on some of those folks, or or later on, um, certainly in the ICU. Okay, but, but the um, ones that, um, and I can maybe think of a couple that we were hoping to be able to extubate in the operating room, but we weren't able to. Again, with 88% success rate, it's only a few. Um, they were um, reversed in the operating room, but I don't think they had good enough uh, tidal volumes. Um, uh, at the time, I don't recall that it was particularly an oxygenation issue, um, but uh, that may have been the case in, in, in others, but maybe not in the series that I've, I've shown. Okay. Do you use ERASP? You know, that's, that's an interesting thing. Um, I, I sort of became uh, familiar with the term just we, as being part of Providence, um, a few times a year, for a while it was bi-monthly, all of the programs in uh, open heart programs, the 20 of us, uh, would, would meet, um, of course, virtually and discuss things. And one of those talks was about ERAS. I think it struck not only myself, but others, oh, wait a minute, we've been doing fast tracking for decades. <laughs> It's now just called something different. And the other thing that there had been some work done by one of our sister institutions in Providence um, about ERAS, and there was a very strong um, industry influence that said, well, in order to have ERAS, you have to use this method of sternal closure with these devices um, for example, um, and all of those things had the potential to really ramp up the cost of care. Um, I'll tell one other story. Um, one of the things that I thought I would initiate um, at Providence was um, a series um, of patients that maybe we could get industry support for Xparel and demonstrate how much it helped people. But right from the start, we were extubating patients in the operating room. There was really no, no claim I could make that was going to uh, justify the added expense of something like Xparel, which is of course, uh, in some centers, uh, part of the ERAS um, protocol. So, um, tongue in cheek, we, we yeah. really need it. <laughs> That's a good one. Uh, thank you. So, um, two more questions left. Please. I think we're going to be right at time, so it worked out perfectly. Yeah. I think you may have covered this, but uh, just to, to bring it up again, is there a role, I know you said your nurses don't like it, is there a role for using LMA airways in the um, early extubation period? Um. We haven't used LMA airways. We've used some um, uh, nasal trumpets. Na I think that's the word for them, nasal trumpets. They, I can think of one or two patients who use them. I think there are, you know, we, 
we so yesterday's patient was someone for whom BiPAP had been no, excuse me CPAP had been recommended preoperatively uh, to him years ago when he just was never interested in it. So naturally, that's a patient for whom we're going to have BiPAP available um, after we're arriving in the in the ICU. Um, we don't hesitate to use BiPAP uh, if if we need it on on uh, some patients because we have a lot of obstructive sleep apnea patients. Yeah, especially if you have such a high risk population you're caring yeah. for. Yeah. Um, and I'm sure your patients probably uh, really appreciate that. Uh, it, usually in the high risk populations, I would assume that patients are probably a little bit more nervous, maybe not used to healthcare systems, um, preventative care and things like that might be something that they're you know not super um, familiar with for whatever reasons, lack of care, lack of uh, um, access to care. And then, you know, it makes those patients are probably more nervous than um, patients who live right across the street from Northwestern, for example, who are very familiar with healthcare systems. And Sure. No, we, you know, we I, have yeah. uh, <laughs> our, our reach. I'm the only cardiac surgeon within 150 miles. <laughs> Truly. <laughs> Do you Truly. have local tenants that come and relieve you, or I I, I have yes, I do have doctor. I do have an individual who'd been coming for for many years, and uh, so yeah, so when I, I get some time off um, with my family, yeah, that 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 happens, but okay. um, but no, I am the only cardiac surgeon within 150 miles, and that means that our that our patient reach. Um, goes to areas where the population isn't dense, like in, you know, the, the Gold Coast of, of, of Chicago. And the other thing, as a result, um, their access to care is a real issue. It is an underserved area. And, it, and they, when they're needing an operation, they're typically urgent. And you saw, I mean, 80% of our coronary bypass patients fall under urgent, they're not elective patients. And um, so we don't really have the luxury of time and of them getting comfortable with CPAP, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and afterwards, then they'll, you know, after their recovery, it's something their primary care doctor will be authorizing a home sleep app, home home sleep study, or or in lab study, or something like that. Um, thank you so much, Dr. Arcid. Yes, I appreciate all of that information you've just shared about your patients, and um, I hope that you do get some vacation time. And I hope oh, we're we're fine. fine. Vascular too. <laughs> we're, we're, a, we're a happy group, and, um, like and really you're doing a great job. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you. Um, wish you the best. And um, I'm going to let Dr. Badwar and Dr. Whitman know that your, their names were mentioned quite a bit in this presentation and share that Please with do. them. And I'll pass along your regards to Dr. Whitman. I'm sorry I wasn't able to join us. But yes. again, congratulations to, to you and your staff, Mark. Thank you so much for being on and for sharing this with me and coming to me and asking asked me this was a perfect topic for our webinar and I'm so happy we were able to share your successful stories and um, I look forward to hearing from more from you in the future on any any projects you may be working on uh, please reach out happy to share thanks Carol and, and I was very serious about our recruitment uh, thing so <laughs> if anyone is there please reach out to Carol and through her you can get to us or however we do it but no Mark has been a stalwart and um, we're um, continuing as a small center to be able to present at meetings. And this is certainly a highlight to be, to be able to present to folks across the country and frankly, internationally. Mm -hmm. Thanks once Wonderful. again, Daryl. Yes, thank you. Thank you. And thanks everybody for joining. Um, our next webinar is December 6th and we'll be presenting on our beta blocker uh, voluntary supplemental data collection form. So please be uh, sure to join on December 6th. Email will be coming out next week with more information on that. Um, thanks again, um, Dr. Arcidi, and thanks again, Mark. I'll see you all later. And hopefully if you're at the annual meeting, we'll run into each other down there. So um, will you be there? I'm hoping to, Carol. Thank you so much. Yeah, I'll look for you. I'll look for you. <laughs> all right. Thanks again, everybody. Have a great rest of the day. Take care. Thank, Thank you. you. Very good. Thank you. Right, thanks, everybody.
Thank you.